<laughs> Just do what you got to do and let me know when you're done. Wow, so feisty this morning. That's a horrible decision. <laughs> Welcome back to the Side by Side Guys Off-Road Podcast. We are once again here at UTV Takeover, Coos Bay, Oregon, uh, inside the Off-Road Syndicate trailer, uh, which is wrapped with all their different sponsors and companies they work with. And uh, one of those sponsors uh, that we're going to talk about today, and that's uh, Pro Eagle uh, Off-Road Jacks. And uh, we also have Russell Porter here. So we have Russell from Buggy Whips, and we also have uh, Chuck Foreman from Pro Eagle. And uh, Russ has been on the program before. Uh, Chuck has uh, is a, a new initiation to the to the group, and uh, it'll be a good time here today. So uh, this is now Friday at the show. Uh, how's the show been going for you guys? Shockingly, actually better than I expected. You know, with the current economy and fuel prices and things of that nature, I really thought we wouldn't see the big crowd and the money being spent, but. It hasn't really for all that much, and, and I'm happy to see it affected this industry. I think there's more people here. There's all the new cars are here. People are spending money. Um, it's It's been a really great event. It's good to see people out again. And, Chuck, how how's it, the reception been to yeah, the yeah. Jacks out yeah. here and where it's all sand? I second that. Yeah, we uh, I talk to people all day for the last couple of days, and they that's all they tell me. is like, I have to load my car into the trailer with th- uh, stock tires and wheels on it. And then change them out, and I'm tired, tired of uh, stacking wood blocks and all that stuff. And you guys have the the best solution out there, so it's been good. I think we sold the jack like one one every hour or so on average, so it's been pretty good for us. Yeah, and so you have a number of different solutions over there that we'll talk about, and we've used them on our BDR trips and and various situations and things like that. And they continue to show up online in various formats as far as like unique ways to use them and get cars off the road. So, um, you know, but uh, Russell, you've been on the show before. You've We've talked many times about safety and and whips and and all that stuff. Uh, what what how's life been going on the whip game since uh, some of those discussions and and how's the industry changed? I know we've had some movement in in that industry and some players moving around and yeah, there's been some people bought and sold and I think at the end of the day, safety is such an important key to this industry and you know Chuck. Very much I've had, I've had we I grew up in Glamis, so I was a Glamis guy from the time I could basically go anywhere. Um, so Glamis is very natural to me. The people, the riding, I don't see it as a dangerous place, right? As long as you're you know doing all the safety things and riding like you should, it's a wonderful place to go. Somebody like Chuck, who's never been to I Glamis, a really, place. <laughs> Chuck <laughs> Chuck thinks it's very dangerous. He's never he went and he was like, this is way too dangerous. That same aspect coming up here, I'm very comfortable in the sand, but this place, Oregon, is probably the most dangerous place I've ridden next to a Hammers in the middle of the week with 100,000 people there. There's people going two ways on trails here. The hills, there's no, like, you know, in Glamis, you get this bull riding. Here, it's just up and over, up and over, and then through these amazing trails and down these woods, and there's just people going everywhere, and so whips here are so important because sometimes you can't see the car and all you can see is that whip and that can potentially save somebody's life here i mean it's safety riding here is so important and i think we've seen it this weekend we see it all the time the greatest thing about utvs is how many people have been able to get into this industry and help grow this industry and continue to make off-road and outside activities just a family event but there's a lot of new drivers here and you know, I've heard probably five or six times this weekend already this argument of there's trails here. So, you know, you do the hand signals. I got five people behind me and then the next driver is four, three, two, one, and then to none. And I've heard some locals here saying, no, you don't do that here. It's a two way street. But to me, I think, why not? What's wrong with that extra safety? If I'm right. going around a corner, I know, hey, guess what? There's somebody here. Maybe I see the whip through the trail. Maybe I hear the exhaust, maybe. But the hand signal is just one extra step. And I you know, I wonder if you're if you've done it or if we've talked about it, but you know, really doing a show dedicated to safety and and things, whether they're required or not, but hey, doing hand signals may help stop an accident or right. may do, you know, whatever help you know people be it, ride safer. And it becomes more important when you're talking about a community atmosphere where we're at a show like this. You know, this isn't just a trade show inside a convention center, right? This is everybody getting out and having a good time. 
partying it up at night and, and going on night rides and and all this stuff like even during uh you know the polaris ride yesterday you know we were all you know 100 cars deep or whatever it was and then a can-am decided to jump in and decide to back into a camping spot right in the middle of everything it's like there's some etiquette that happens and changes, you know, from a normal day to day event where you're on the dunes versus at with a thousand people on the dunes. Um, and when you're talking about going through like one of the big draws out here is duning through the trees, right? right. You're not in Glamis where it's all open. Yeah. We do have open dunes here, but one of the big draws is you can you can dart in and out of the trees <laughs> at high speed and then pop out on the beach, go down the beach, jump back into the trees and back into the open and it's it's a unique experience um, that not not a lot of people know about. Uh, but during the day, you have no indicators, right? Except for the guy telling you that there's three more people behind him. Yeah. And but that first guy, who knows, right? Right. And so there's a there's a real truth to the idea that um, it can be safer to drive at night, in, in a lot of cases, right? Um, and when you're in the in the in all the knobs and the trees and the branches and the bushes and whatever, um, a day whip. Uh, as we call it, really isn't visible in those scenarios, especially at speed, right? right? You're not, you're, you're not going to see the tip flowing around and then coming at you. Right. And who knows if they're going to go left, right, forward, backwards, whatever. Um, and so a lot of guys do consider it safer out here at night where you can see headlights coming, you can see whips glowing, you know, if there's an orb, you know, the, the Marine layer comes in it starts getting foggy. You can see a little glowing orb going around and you know, someone's out there no matter what they got going on. But definitely speaking to what you're saying is that you know, we, we really have to address safety in a new way with our industry growing the way it is, um, not only in just the explosive growth that we've had over COVID, but just in the idea that there's so many cars on the market now and that eventually those are going to get in the hands of people that don't know what they're doing. And we need to be a little bit, we've talked before about as a community being responsible to educate each other, be holding ourselves accountable um, and being good examples and steward of our sport. Sure. Um, but there's definitely a, a need to, to do produce content that people can can latch onto and search and, and and so i totally agree with you maybe we should have a sheriff on along with an emt and then you know kind of talk about their scenarios that they see day to day out here on the dunes or in the mountains or whatever and kind of glean some of that experience for them well and i think one of the one of the greatest things about utv takeover this is by far probably the best event anywhere as far as utvs and off-road is concerned i mean jim and steve and yourself and everybody that puts this together is just absolutely the volunteers this event is amazing but here's what makes this event so uniquely special from anything else and you can use a pro eagle jack or buggy whips or rugged radio or whoever it is but you buy a utv and you go through the store and you walk and you're like oh yeah i need whips what's the law i'll buy the basic oh i need a jack i'll go to harbor freight what's the basic and then you get here and you realize wait i got a stack blocks of wood this is dangerous wait I don't have a lighted whip during the day. This is dangerous. Oh, wait, I bought this helmet because it's the law. Wait, this really doesn't allow me to communicate with my passengers or the front driver or, hey, I really need calm. So at an event like this, you get the new people that come in because you walk through a showroom. You're like, is that product really something I need? Right. And then you yeah. come here and you <clears throat> see somebody jacking a car up with a Pro Eagle and you're like, wait a second. Now you can start to connect the dots. You go on a ride and you come back. We saw that at Hammers. I mean, I think Chuck and I experienced that a lot at Hammers where – it gets dusty and then all of a sudden everybody's coming to my booth going, well, wait a second, we need a whip. I can't see. I nearly got hit six times out there. But when you're in a store and there's no none of those conditions, you don't see it. So here you get to come and experience the condition and then come and talk to the vendor. You get to you know unload your car and then go, wait a second, this is cool. I bought a Harbor Freight Jack for $100, but now I have no way to get my car off the ground. And now you got to search for blocks. You got to search for this. You got to do this. Where you come here and now you're like, oh, I can go talk to Pro Eagle and, oh, this is why I need this and this is why this jack is so much better. And so you really get to have that community involvement and that and you realize why these other products don't work for this industry and why the products that are sold here are sold here. Yeah, there's definitely um, a huge part of seeing context at play, right? Like you can come down here and at first glance, you look at maybe one of the retailers that are doing service here on site. And you see them jacking it up with a Pro Eagle with an extension or whatever. And you figure, okay, yeah, they're a service shop. They just invested in their tools and they got some nice tools or whatever. 
But then you see, then you stop and think about what you just did at the trailer, and thinking mm. about how sketchy that was. <clears throat> yeah. Um, and uh, especially when you're talking about rescue missions and or just repairs, and um, you know, you're out and about, you're at you're at the campsite, and you don't have your garage full of tools and stuff. So you're trying to make things work somehow. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and there's and there are safe ways to handle situations like that. Um, and there are definitely a lot more unsafe ways to handle situations like that. So Chuck, when you're talking about doing some of that stuff, you know, kind of give us the rundown on the generation of where did the Jack come from? What was the mindset that designed that Jack brought it to fruition? What sets it apart as a product and, and why you felt it was such a, a need in the market? Uh, so in the beginning, now actually it was just the, the two ton Jack without large wheels and axles. And, uh, then it just, um, you know, that it was, was like all, a shop jack, right? Yeah, yeah. That was, and it, but it had a skid plate on the bottom. It had the extension. It had most of the accessories on there. But um, uh, it was always the goal to get the you know the large wheels and the axles so that it rolled easier. Um, but it was just because I saw a hole in the market that you know it wasn't there. You know, we myself included were buying you know Harbor Freights or Craftsman jacks or whatever it may be, and then we were adding all these other additional accessories to it. But if there was ever a problem with the jack, we took it back to Craftsman or Harbor Freight or whatever, and they said, "Get out of here," because you know you've modified that jack now, and it's right. you know even if you had a warranty on it, wherever it was, it's no longer valid because you've modified the jack. So nobody was doing it directly out of the box and backing it up with a warranty and um, aftermarket parts that you could buy off of the you know the website and such. So um, that's where we came from. It was just a necessity, and and uh, and it's grown from there. And you know, like he said, you know, we, we I sold probably two or three jacks so far this week just based off of customer feedback because you know, hey, I went over to um, Superior Motorsports and bought some some paddle tires and wheels, and they used that you know your jack to to. Uh, uh, jack, jack my car up to, to be able to mount them and i realized that you know i'm gonna have to do that now when i put it back in my trailer and such so i need one of those jacks um um one of the guys was out there running the other uh, yesterday and uh debeated a tire and somebody had a pro eagle phoenix jack on their car and they were able to use it to help them to lift the tire up and and they must have had co2 or something like that so they were able to reseat the bead and and continue on their ride but he came back and he's like hey if that wouldn't have happened i would have been walking back you know right. so i need to get one of these for my car for sure so um yeah so it's definitely helped to being out here and having people see them in action and and uh and uh it helps to connect the dots for them for sure so, so when you had the idea to build a jack, is that when Pro Eagle started as a company? It was like you had to, to build around that, and then, and then how did you grow from there? Uh, it is. So the parent company is actually a private label manufacturer. So we're a supplier of jacks for uh, a couple large uh, companies in the United States. And it was an idea that I took to them because we were already building jacks for them. And they saw the off-road market as too small as a niche area, and they said, we're not interested. So at that moment right there, I'm like, well, I'm still going to do it. I'm just going to do it and create my own name and brand. Um, and, and that's what we did. So and it's just gone, grown from there. And so how long have you been in the manufacturing process of, of building jacks and all that? Uh, manufacturing, that was even before I started there. So they've been manufacturing jacks uh, since 2001, I believe, maybe even before that. Uh, and then Pro Eagle was born in 2013. And so your day-to-day -day job is Pro Eagle, or do you have a mix of things going on? Yeah, so I still manage all the private label brands. Uh, customers have issues there, and all the manufacturing of that, um, some engineering of those things, and then Pro Eagle is 100% me. Uh, we have a lot of help on on, on board now. Um, we have a you know in-house engineer, and we have you know uh, a lot of other things that I didn't have for many years. Uh, but now we have marketing, and we're doing a lot more advertising and stuff. That's uh, it's taken a lot off my plate. It's helped um, to me to be able to come out of the shows like this, you know, out of having to balance sales and marketing and do all that stuff and be at the shows and events and and still package and ship stuff and design and everything like that. Uh, it's helped to um, uh, ease my job a little bit. <laughs> right. Yeah. And we've talked, <clears throat> Russell and I, about, you know, how the whip game went from being, you know, mostly a, a industrial product uh, for safety reasons and then crossing over into a market that I had no clue about the safety aspect they all right. thought it was about the bling factor <laughs> um you know there was a transition process between an industrial to consumer product right and uh over the last however many years it's been now it's really 
been kind of a, an explosive growth of like the Pro Eagle Jacks being on the race scene and being incorporated to teamwork and right. um, these uh, chase trucks and, and even on the buggies themselves, right? Yeah. Uh, what was the inflection point there that it went from being a consumer uh, thing that you were trying to sell at a, pre a premium product at a premium level to being that thing that everybody in the racing industry uh, and then everything surrounding it started to rely on? Actually, it was quite the opposite. So I went after the motorsports and racing industry first. Um, because those are the people that realized that they needed it. Those are the people that didn't necessarily have an issue with paying an extra hundred dollars for something that made their life more simple. Right. Uh, or they could just take right out of the box and it worked for their trophy truck or for their UTV or for whatever it was. Uh, so the motorsports minded person was the guy that really got it first. And that's what helped to the people outside of that, that emulate that market or that pay attention to what, you know, Andy McMillan uses on his vehicle, and I want to use the same thing. Um, so that what that's what helped to grow that market is getting the hardcore people, the professionals in the motorsport industry, to stand behind it and realize that you know it was a it was a tool that they needed, and and then it's grown from there. And that was really the bigger market was the consumer market. You know, the guy that has the Chevy 1500 that's lifted that didn't realize that his factory jack will no longer work <laughs> or or just going down to his local, um, you know, parts store and buying a floor jack. You know, that still didn't work. You know, what about the fact that when you go out there with your 1500 because you don't have a UTV or whatever and you're playing with that vehicle and you have a flat tire or a broken shock or a tie rod in or a ball joint or whatever, you know, what are you going to do? You know, you're carrying your your cheaper jack that you bought with you but it's still not going to work right. you know so we'd add that and then we you know we have all the mounting solutions to be able to bolt into the vehicle so it's not rolling around or going anywhere then it calculates uh, the the handles we have a toolkit so we've thought of all of that stuff so we have a complete package so um that's what helped to grow it is to get those guys that are the normal consumer to stand behind it so what was the first jack that you came out with uh the first jack was the two ton is now called the og uh, but it was just a two-ton uh, standard wheel jack, um, similar to just the garage jack. And we still offer that, and it's still actually we're a really good seller. Um, but it, like I said, it had a built-in skid plate. It had, came with the extension and such, and then it's just uh, grown from there. And then now what does the product look, line look like compared to that jack? Now we, we talked about putting bigger wheels on it. That has a lot of benefits and getting through the dirt, rolling yeah. around the shop over cords, things like that. Yeah. Uh, but what does that product set look like now? Uh, so now we have a, a, a complete line. We have all the way from a 1.5 ton with the big wheels. We have the two ton OG, the two ton big wheel, the three ton big wheel. And then we have a um, two different uh, CO2 operated jacks that you can carry in a UTV that are small, lightweight. Uh, it comes in a bag. You can mount it on a roll bar, um, a single stage jack. And then we have a, a dual stage jack now. Um, there's a lot of other companies that have come along with us too. Uh, power tank makes an adapter kit now, so you can use a smaller power tank to power it, which increases the capacity of that jack up to 3000 pounds, which opens us up to the market of, you know, the smaller Toyota Tacomas or Forerunners or whatever, the people that don't want to carry a, a floor jack in their vehicle, but still need a, a jack that'll work on the trail. Um, so, so yeah. How, how did you come to the CO2 solution? Like you go from a hydraulic pressed floor jack how did you get to to converting to a co2 jack and utilizing that tech tech in the in the world uh it, it was always something that we wanted to do and knew that i needed to do to have an onboard utv jack the utv jack is or i should say utv industry is probably altogether 20 to 30 percent of our market as a whole and um they're buying the three ton jack because when they work on it they need that you know the the total height to get off the ground but they also tow their UTV with a, with a, you know, 2,500 truck and they tow it in a, in an enclosed trailer. So they want one jack that completes it for all the vehicles, but on the UTV getting out on the trail, when you have an accident or a flat tire or an issue out on the trail, then your big jack is still back at camp or it's still in the trailer or whatever. So you need to have a jack for that vehicle. So as I knew that we had to have a vehicle or sorry, a jack that would work for those vehicles, um, but just designing the right one. And we had a, uh, a tube jack in the works similar to like an EGM or others. And, um, 
Baugh Designs had a CO2 jack that they had made many, many years ago and had stopped because they moved towards more of the lighting and moved away from all the other things that they were doing. And uh, they came to me and said, hey, we discontinued this jack uh, a couple years ago and we still get, you know, two or three calls a month asking about it. And we still have designs for it. We own the designs and the rights to it. If you guys want it, then, you know, take over it. You're the jack guys. We're the lighting guys. You know, we'd love to have somebody pick this up and, uh, and run with it. So we did that. We took the design from them and made it a lot more user friendly, um, easier to use and uh, put it in a package that even Baugh Designs was like, that's what it should have been from the beginning. And um, um, then we came out with a dual stage jack and then, uh, um, you know, not giving away too many secrets, but I have that that tube jack still in the works and uh, it'll be out soon, too. So. That sounds good because there's, there's, there's a lot of different needs in different styles of, of product, just like yeah. in, in whips and everything else, right? We have various terrains and situations where things are just work differently. Right. Um, so when we're talking about safety, you know, we're talking the, the whip game and, and keeping yourself safe on the dunes. Uh, there's a lot of safety aspect when you're putting your life on the line, getting underneath the car, right? Like that's yeah kind of something that's kind of important right you don't want that thing rolling over on you um <laughs> <laughs> and uh you know a lot of times like you said we we find blocks of wood we find wheel chocks we find whatever the case is to try to get that extra little bit of height um you know how often are you seeing people make that mistake and what are you doing with your product to kind of like avoid that situation um I see it often and I people actually actually one of my biggest selling features is people making their own mistakes and coming to us later and going, hey, you know, I should have just done that from the beginning. Um, but, you know, I don't do anything uh, sales and marketing wise to put any of that down or I don't build any fear in any of the other you know products to say to help to sell mine. Um, you know, it just is what it is. We, um, you know, that was just a, a something that i knew from the beginning that i had to build a product that just wouldn't have issues wouldn't fail and we still have some small issues here and there but as you said you know lives are on the line sometimes and you know we don't carry jack stands in vehicles like we should and you know we're laying underneath a car like you shouldn't do it's you know it's a lift it's not a jack stand right. um, but we know people do it you know so we definitely wanted to make the safest product possible so that when you're out in those situations and you're doing something you know you shouldn't do uh you're still as safe as, as you could be so so what is what are some of the trends we're seeing with uh you guys are both now deeply embedded in the in the racing scene and the utv off-road scene um what are some of the trends you're starting to see with uh like these chase trucks and and these groups that are having to take their entire crews out in the middle of baja and stuff like that <laughs> like uh we i think we hit on before like people are now set coming during the race and saying hey i can't be seen uh you know on course you know trying to rescue my guy um are there any other situations where we're starting to see a little bit more awareness and and willingness to, to, ex to extend themselves to, to stay safe well, i think you're seeing that everywhere i think you're seeing that across the board i mean you know just like when chuck started or i started or any of this look at the involvement i mean yesterday i rode in a pro r for the first time that car can hit whoops at 90 miles an hour stock right <laughs> and like it's nothing like you're on a cloud so as these cars evolve and things get faster and now you're talking what less than an hour or a couple of hours between a trophy truck and a pro r you know your teams are getting out there and it's no longer just everything is so much faster it's moving so much faster there's so much more going on that i think keeping yourself visible and using the right tool for the job is becoming that much more important right mm -hmm. and and being aware for every situation, you know, that's the, the, the thing I will say about the Pro Eagle Jack is that other manufacturers, and not to talk down, same thing with the whip industry, they build the product to the bare minimum, right? So if you look at hitches, for example, every hitch is rated, you know, if a hitch is rated for 10,000 pounds, it's really actually designed to tow 50,000 pounds because they know everybody's going to overload it, right? The safety factor, yeah. Right. So the same thing when we build a whip, we design it to hit trees and hit things and do, you know, Braddock rolled, Bruceland rolled. They smashed the tabs off the car and didn't break the product. It's because I'm not trying to build a product to just meet the bare minimum. Pro Eagle's not trying to build a product to just meet the bare minimum. We're trying to meet the next level that we can't even think of. I mean, Chuck and I were traveling to Moab and blew a tire on the side of the freeway with no room 
literally on the side of the freeway. <laughs> Semi's passing us at 80 an miles an hour. Line. <laughs> Three cars and a stacker, 24,000 pounds, and we had to change a tire, and we did it with Pro Eagle Jacks. I guarantee you, Chuck didn't ever think that we were going to be changing basically a semi truck on the side of the road <laughs> and we did right so so to answer your question i think the industry as a whole is getting bigger the the things that are happening in this industry are getting faster and bigger and you have to have the right tool and the right whip for the job i mean i won't say anything about another whip company here but i've talked to multiple of them here because there's several of them here and it always comes back to the same thing i'm like why don't you just meet the next level right everybody offers you know we, the other jack companies, the other whip companies, oh, I'll offer a lifetime warranty. Well, why not just build a product that doesn't fail? We don't know what everybody's going to do out here. I don't know what the customer's going to do, but why not build a product that won't fail? You know, seals and jacks and dustproof stuff. And same thing for us, making it. I had customers asking if they can use it in marine applications. The applications are becoming so much more diverse right. and just different nowadays. Speaking of marine, that's really taken off from what I've seen online. A lot of guys are starting to get smaller boats. They're starting to get a little bit more aggressive with the, what they do on the river and stuff like that. Uh, and the whips look cool, but it's actually kind of interesting to see that safety is important both you know, on water as just as much as it is on land. I think safety is important everywhere. I think it's it, that's what happens, right? And it happens the same thing with jacks or anything, right? You have an accident, and it's like, well, how can we make it better? You have an accident. Things happen. We don't ever want anybody to have any kind of accident or issue. So, yeah, whips on boats are safer because you can see things. You can keep them more visible. And I think part of it is changing the laws too, right? Finding things. You're you're seeing in the mining industry now this massive shift towards LED whips, right, where there really wasn't that before. But we've been I'll be mines. honest. I had no clue. Yeah. <laughs> right <laughs> but there's these huge shifts we went to a mine and they're like oh we don't need that and we filmed and showed it and then they're like well, wait a second that is way safer that keeps my guy safer that keeps my equipment safer that keeps all this stuff chuck's seeing it chuck's in the mining industry now and we did mine expo together and you see it people are like well, wait that is going to be a safer way potentially save a life because the jack's not going to fall or slip or i don't have guys doing dumb things with blocks and it, it just becomes better for everybody when we just hit that next level of making sure products will do whatever the customer is going to do. I think that that's the key right there, though, is uh, you can look at it. There's many different brands out here. Most of them are enthusiasts run and there's an enthusiast that are backing the company, enthusiasts that are using the product. But for the most part, in the jack industry, there's maybe a handful, two or three, and those two or three are extremely expensive. And there's one or two whip companies, and you know they're on the higher end. The other, everybody else is just giving you what the overseas company made and 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 sent over and said this is what'll work. Whereas, we're copying that right, product. right. Whereas Buggy Whip or Pro Eagle, we're designing product for what we do out here. You know, we're going, oh, shoot, when you do this, it doesn't work. Let's change that and make it better. When you do this type of customer or this type of client or this type of vehicle, it doesn't work for that. Let's make it better. For us, each step is, you know, oh, these seals don't like, you know, sand and dirt. Let's change that. You know, this doesn't work that way when it gets dirty and dusty. Let's change that. Let's make it better. And whereas he's the same way, whereas the other guys are just, you know, what we have is what we have. You know, my manufacturing facility is overseas. The engineers are overseas. This is what we've got. And, and the interesting <coughs> thing is that, you know, when you when you make a good proper tool, like what like a whip, you don't consider a whip a tool, but we consider a whip a tool. Like it's, yeah. it's a safety tool. And when you build a tool for its singular purpose to do it like at a high level, then it applies to different industries just out of the gate. Like you're talking about getting into the mining industry. It's not, it's not that like you're purposely building a mining jack. It's that you're building the thing that does the thing that everybody needs, no matter what industry you're in. Right. And it's not that you went out to serve every industry. It's just you did, you're doing such a good job of the attention to detail and the and the process of execution, you know, that it, it applies across the board. Right. Well, I think it, it, when when you see companies at the top of their game, right, or you see athletes at the top of their game, this is going to sound. I mean, no, we're going to get comments on this. I don't believe in competition, and and here's why. To me, when people go, oh, competition breeds better products, right? 
that's because everybody's trying to hit this level, right? So if somebody does this level, then they move up, right? It's this this ladder that they're just trying to get to the next rung. I'm trying to get to the top rung no matter what any of these other companies are doing, right? I, I don't care what you're doing down here. In 2016, we could have released a whip that was here, but we didn't. We released a whip that was here and brought all these guys to this level. Then we went here and brought this next level up. And the same thing with Chuck. He didn't go out and go, I'll just put big wheels on a Harbor Freight Jack and we'll call it good. No, he's like, we'll redesign this. We'll look at pumps. We'll look at seals. We'll look at skid plates. We'll look at all this stuff. He didn't just take something and do the next level. He went for the top of the rung and I think that's the difference between companies that are really involved in this that are trying to hit that next level is you're building products that are so far from what everybody else is doing and saying, you know, they're, I, the competition thing to me always bothered me because it's like, no, you're just trying to hit the next level and waiting for somebody to make you bump. I want to be up here no matter what everybody else is doing. And I think with whips and jacks, you see it. I saw Chuck post something the other day where the guy was using a jack to lift a stove in the kitchen like roll a stove a double-edged stove <laughs> like you're not designing jack going oh yeah they're going to use that to roll a stove in but they do right oh they're going to use a whip as a flashlight but they are or using it you're a big photographer they use they use whips to light up different glaciers and put it under for different lights and lightscaping and there's all these applications you don't think about but if you build a product to hit that next level the consumer will find a way to use it right so to me it's not other competition that makes me push harder it's the consumer when anybody comes in the booth i'm like i want your feedback go out there and do something and come back to me and go i need it for this that's what i want to see and i think that's what is cool about the off-road industry is you're seeing cars get faster and people's skills get better and you're just seeing people use stuff like they've never used it right why has snap-on always been on the top of their game because everybody knows you use a wrench as a hammer right and that's what you do so if you build the tool for the hammer then you can use it for that and some of that storyline is also the snap-on effect of you hand that down, right? Like it's a, it's a, it's going to be there a year from now, two years, ten right. years from now. Yeah. And you can't. There's a lot of product on the market, especially in the UTV industry, where we grew out of a mindset that if we break it, it's fine. It's only another hundred bucks, right? If we destroy half the car in the dunes, it only takes me a week to rebuild it. You know, we're getting to a point now, like you were saying earlier, about bigger, faster, stronger cars. Well, that leads into the mindset of, well, I can't just break the arm off anymore because it's going to cost me another $1,200 mm. to get the parts. <laughs> it's going to cost me six months of waiting if I can wait that long. You know, there's a lot more to it now. Uh, and especially with other people having those same things coming at you at 90 miles an hour, you're starting to think a little bit more about how you're going to approach things, how you're going to be safe in that situation. Um, and, but to go back, you you should build a product you should have a mindset to build a product or a service or whatever that case is to last you further than just the first initial application it should mm -hmm. be something that's long term because there should be no reason why you shouldn't be buying a tool that fixes the solution only now you should be fixing it the entire way through yeah and i think that's i think you hit something it's a multi-generation i mean we've had it here already where customers like i i know buggy what my dad ran or my grandfather ran it and that's the cool thing about being in business for 55 years and I think that's the really cool thing that's going to be awesome to see with Pro Eagle over the next, you know, several decades is, you know, Andy McMillan's sons or kids or daughters or whoever is his generation for racing is going to be like, oh, I remember when my dad ran a Pro Eagle and, hey, we still have that truck sitting in our shop that has a Pro Eagle jack on it. I mean, I think that's going to be the cool thing for Pro Eagle is that same kind of thing where you see these generations and, and kids that come into it that go, oh, I remember Pro Eagle. That's, you know, Chuck didn't just build a product. He built a brand. He built something that his kids can be proud of and the next generation can be proud of. And I think that's the difference from some of the companies is like you said earlier, is there's a lot of acquisitions going on. A lot of people build a company to sell it or at least for me, I'm not in this to sell it. I want to be here for a hundred years. I want somebody's great, great, great grandkid to come in and go, man, I remember I still have that in the garage. That's the memory of the family trip we took or whatever. And I think Chuck wants that same thing. He doesn't want to sell it. It's like, hey, I remember working to my dad. That's a memory I have where we were working on the car, the project, and I used a Pro Eagle Jack and I still have it because of the memory of my dad or my grandpa or my mom or whoever. To me, that's what makes this special. And I think there's a lot of opportunity for the Jacks just in like what I've seen in racing. Like I, I, a couple of years ago, I can't remember who it was, but this team Can-Am, 
they're on the side of King of Hammers climb, and then all of a sudden they're they're hitting a flat or whatever. They have to throw the jack down, get the tire changed, you know. And there was a whole storyline around that event because they were, I think, they were in first or whatever. And yeah. you know, that product is what saved the day yeah. to get them to the finish line. Right. And just the way that it happened, where it happened, the timing it happened, the way they popped yeah. out and made it happen. Yeah. You know, I can see those things being up on the shelf in the shop, being like that. That is King of Hammers 2019 or whatever it was. Yeah. Um, just like you would see a hood or a, a, a fender or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. It was Kyle Cheney. So Kyle Cheney was leading the uh, King of the Hammers and uh, rolled the car. Uh, him and the co-driver couldn't push it back over. And um, luckily, they had cell service enough to where somebody had uh, called or texted texted them or something and said, Hey, use the Jack, use the Jack. So they forgot about it. I'm like, Oh yeah. So they got the Jack out, used the, the CO2 Jack, the Phoenix Jack to lift the car up and push it back over. Well, they forgot to put it in, in gear. So the car, <laughs> so the car started rolling back down the hill, ran him over. Um, so he had to slide down the hill on the, on his butt. He told the co-driver as he's getting in the car, go back and get the Jack. So they ran back up there, grabbed the jack, and came back down. He actually uh, he was leading, but I think he ended up in second place. Yeah, he had a broken yeah. ankle or something right. from the from, rollover. From the rollover, yeah, But yeah. he finished the race on it. Right, and from that point on, he's been approached by a couple other companies. He's like, nope, Pro Eagle for, for, for life for me. <laughs> so, yeah, it, it just it is you know when you have a tool that fits that need of tight, compact, able to to fit wherever on a race car. We all know. It, there's not a lot of room for stuff yeah. and fluff and things that you don't need, right? You're, you're pulling everything off that car you don't want. And, and more often than not, I'm seeing a bottle jack on the back of those cars, you know, right, right where it needs to be so they can quickly change it in or out or whatever. Yep. And your story about uh, Cheney, you know, it, it was more about not fixing the car. It was more about recovery of the car. Right. And they were able to get it up just high enough to get leverage and push it over which was, you know, still entertaining for the consumer to watch, but uh, but as a race team, I can imagine that was like the definition of that race. Really, is what is what it came down to. Yeah. So, um, you know, more and more we're seeing uh, the the big red buggy whip power wagon going down the road with the Blue Eagle trailer. <laughs> um, how how did you guys come together? How did you guys meet? And and how did the bromance start? I think he saw my long hair and fell in love. I'm pretty that's sure exa- that's what happened. That's exactly it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and Chuck just recently proposed. Congratulations. Thank you, sir. Uh, yep. I'm pretty sure you proposed to him at some point, and he, <laughs> he, he, <laughs> and he was taken, so you had to move on. Yeah, but. yeah, yeah. She <laughs> says that uh, he's my first girlfriend, and that she's my second. Yeah. <laughs> it uh, actually Adrian, right? Is yeah. The one that introduced us, and and Adrian's a good friend of both of ours, and. You know, I met Chuck five years ago. I was actually thinking about today. It's been almost exactly five years, right? Yeah, just about. Yeah, and it's, you know, I think what works for Chuck and I, on top of the fact that we think the same way, and at the end of the day, we want to do the same things when we leave the show or when we're here and we have the same mentality about life, um, is that the products work together, right? If you need a jack, you need a whip. You know, we can do these industrial shows and the shows here, and it just clicks, right? They're... Both of us, we, you know, I met a guy at SEMA that started Buggy Whip Australia and we sell our product down there. And then I introduced him to Chuck and now he's Pro Eagle. And it, the, the products just work together. You need both of them when you're, no matter the situation, if it's industrial or commercial or off road. And so we became friends and, and started how, doing how, shows what together. What consumer would have thought that, right? Like you wouldn't just walk up and be like, oh, a whip and a jack, right? They're completely different product sets, but they, like you said, they always tie together because they're always being applied in the same genre the same of things. Same group of people, same industry. Yeah. yeah, And it just works. It's just, it's clicked and we've had a lot of fun together. And, and, and it's nice when you meet somebody that goes through the same struggles, right? I think this industry and most industries in life have a lot of fluff where, you know, you call your buddy or you call somebody in the industry like, hey, what's going on or what's this vibe or what are you seeing or, hey, I'm hearing this and, oh, no, sales are the highest they've ever been and everything is perfect and, you know, there's unicorns dropping out of the sky and you're like, okay, I know that's not true, but all right, moving <laughs> on. Where I can call Chuck and go, hey, this is what I'm seeing. Are you seeing the same thing? Or, hey, this is the struggle we're having. Are you seeing the same thing? And it's nice to have somebody, a friend that, We'll give you the honest truth, like, hey, this is what we're seeing, or hey, here's an idea I had, and I, we, I don't feel threatened by him, and I don't think he feels threatened by me. I think it's a good partnership where we can help each other find different things in different avenues and work together and grow together, and you know, and having different perspective to offer, right? Like we get so buried in what we're focused on 
that we don't really a lot of times see that outside perspective when you for sure when you're yeah. seeing you know safety aspects of a jack or if you're right. seeing you know applications for whips where you didn't think about them um you know we've talked about lighting applications for your whips that you know tradition like a year ago no one would have really thought about per se um and uh it's nice to have someone to bounce off of like that especially when they're not tied to you like you know what i mean like right. you can have like sister companies that work together but they're always tied to each other so they have the same perspective and when you don't work when you're not tied to each other i mean you guys are kind of tied at the hip but if you're not tied <laughs> together financially and right. development cycles and all that stuff sure. you know uh, your your bulk order quantities and you know stupid stuff like that you have a different perspective on things um but uh i think it's an interesting point you made about working together at shows uh and being able to talk openly and honestly with each other there's so many businesses that are in our industry right now that have grown out of the mom and pop phase. They've moved past that SMB phase and they're in that like medium business that's going to be eventually sold or, or grow or whatever. And they get real rigid. They get real kind of like white noise with, with partners and people in the industry. And like you said, you know, everything's perfect. We're growing fast. We're at 10 X every year, blah, blah, like, you know, there's a part of that storyline where you're like, okay, I have to filter out some of that to get down to the actual meat of that discussion we just had. Sure. Um, and I think one of the things about our industry that's so important is we have this community, right? We have this vibe of everyone working together, helping lift each other up. And I think it's super important as brands, as businesses to bring each other up alongside of ourselves. And, and I, I think I get scared when brands get bought out and get investment groups, you know, too deep into their pockets and, or, or just, just the conglomerations that happen where it becomes impersonal, becomes cold, becomes a warranty, becomes a customer service call versus a discussion versus working with you to make sure that you're taken care of with what you actually need versus what you what you want because marketing told you you wanted it yeah i think that i think that happens in life general i think one of the amazing things about off-road is you don't see that right like so look at take prp for example right it got acquired right by a massive company or take baja designs or any of these companies Aaron still goes to shows, right? This dude doesn't have to show up to shows and he's still building seats and he's still at the shows and he's still on all the rides. And I think that's the really unique thing about off-road is no matter how many times something gets acquired, yeah, the business practice may change, but you still see that fame. I mean, take Ryan Edwards but, at but it KMC. Doesn't, it doesn't happen know, all thing. the time. It's right. just those people that you know are still building awesome unique products sure. is because there's still people that are enthusiasts that are involved yeah. and I, that's sure. kind of the point i was getting yeah. to was that we have a kind of divide in the industry of brands that are copying each other that that bar we were talking about right that competition the the race that you don't it's it's, it's a race right like you're, you're just trying to win that first race to get to the next race so right. you're, you're copying what they're doing and then being a little better part on it or a little sure. better quality thing or a better warranty or whatever you're not shooting for the moon, Correct. right? When you shoot for the moon, you're you have a different perspective because you're up here. You're looking at the bigger picture. Right. You're not looking at just who's around you, next to you on the on the track, right? Right. And that's the difference that I'm that I've that I get scared about is like everyone's so focused on beating the next person that they that they will whitewash the entire conversation <laughs> versus being open and honest to say, yeah. No, we, we recognize that we're going to fix that. You know, we're, this is how we're going to do that. And we appreciate the feedback. Right. For sure. And, and, and it's it, with how the, the, the economics that are coming into this industry, as far as a broader scale, um, generally brings people in that don't care. Right. The money talks and then that's it. Yes. And so, and, and I'm talking on a consumer side, right. like they just don't care. Like it, they have the money, they throw it at it and then they move on. So when I talk about discussions with brands, I'm talking about the customer relationship, the personality, like you were talking with, with Aaron and all those guys, it's like they, they're, they're passionate. They're part of the community and sure. our community can get sterile real fast. Mm -hmm. If it, if it gets grows with a, such a big market that they're just kind of people that do it for the cool factor versus the passion for it. Right. And, and so it's always important for me to translate that message. Like we need to, push that message out. Our passion is matters in this sport. It's what drives the sport. It's what grew our sport, right. you know? Yeah. And, and it, it could, if we're not as consumers passionate externally, 
to those around us and protecting it and saying, this is something special. Don't screw it up. It could potentially become something a little bit more sterile, like NASCAR or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That would be interesting if this became NASCAR. <laughs> it would be super interesting sport. Now, oval track UTV racing, that I could get behind that. That could yeah, be, be fun. fun. <laughs> I, 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 could, I could see that. Yeah. I could, that could be fun. No, I, and I think you're right. And I think that's, that's, and you, you recognize those people in that industry. I mean, like Chuck was saying, and, and I think you, you can pick apart those companies that are really going to be here for a long time and are lifetime companies and aren't just going to be bought out and, traded and and you can tell the consumers that are passionate about it versus the ones that just bought a utv to come out and they're going to be over it in six months when it's you know when it's no it, longer pushing your product or correct. your hot message or your whatever correct. and and that's i mean you can also see that in how that product's being pitched like who's behind the table it really makes a difference if it's just somebody you hired because they're cheap and effective and you know whatever like they're not going to have that same message and vibe and they're not going to connect with the consumer and they're not going to represent your brand the way you want them to. Right. Um, and so that's always cool to see guys like you that are at the top level of the companies still being passionate about the sport and the products and the, and the application um, and being willing to be vulnerable with the consumer versus this is my message. That's how much it is. Have a nice day. Yeah. And I think you see that even with builders, you know, or, or people in the industry like Lindsay Geyser and Jeffrey's performance and RJ I mean, I think the big builds for the most part have went away and they're still pushing the envelope. Yeah, they're not doing the builds like the 900s where it was all the fancy doors and that. They're slimming it down and now doing these incredible motor builds with Evo and Jim and Todd. And, and you see the passion behind those guys, right? You see the passion behind Lindsay and RJ and they're just great people. And you see how passionate they are about the sport and every year they're raising the game and raising what they're doing and trying to improve. And you can pick those companies out that really love this and love the people behind it. So when we talk about growing in the industry and, and how much it, ex it exploded over COVID versus, you know, kind of where we're trending, you know, as far as recuperating from that, <laughs> um, I can't remember who I was talking to last night, but just the idea that we're going to get back to quote unquote normal, this whole like last two years or whatever is not normal. It was, it's been a fantastic for the businesses that have benefited from it, but that's not normal, right? We got to recorrect and get back to a normal playing field. Um, you know, what are you guys looking forward to and not looking forward to in this next you know year or so? Is it something that, uh, you guys think you can, you can weather because of that investment in your, in your product quality and your messaging and, and all that? Or is it something that, um, normal no longer is good enough. We got to keep pushing for better. I think we have to keep pushing for better. I think, I mean, depends on how far down the rabbit hole you want to go here, but <laughs> the next year is going to be, the next several years are going to be super interesting. And, and what I'm curious to see, you know, a, there's a lot of companies that rose during COVID, you know, garage builders from garage builders to corporations that grew and acquisitions that happened. And what's going to be really curious, I, I'm kind of out on a limb, I think, with this versus everybody else, is a lot of people think that the smaller guys are going to fade away. But this is what happens where the smaller guys, they start pushing to that next level because they can go back. They can get a separate job and come in and, and design and build things where your bigger corporations are going to look at the 12 or 13 brands they have and go, yep, that one's not making money drop it. I can do it. That's not making money. Drop it. I can do it. Right. And you're going to see these, these, maybe these name brand guys that really push this industry for the last several years fade away. I mean, take four wheel parts, for example, and Polaris's big sell to wheel pros for $50 million, $650 million loss over several years, right? They saw what's coming and they moved on, right? So how many of these big companies are going to drop brands that they acquired because it's just not hitting the point anymore. So I think the next two years could be really interesting. Um, I think the sport is going to continue. I think COVID, one of the good things is a lot of people saw, I, I think as a, as a world, people want to get back to family. I think we got away from that for a long time where for it was sure. all about work and I got to have this much. And I think you see people now going, I, I don't maybe have to go to Disneyland. I don't have to go to Six Flags. And Maybe I can just take my family camping and go out. So I think the sport as a whole is going to continue to grow and be something really special and kind of get back to that 80s family really out here enjoying it. But I think the, the people in this industry, it's going to change drastically over the next two years.
Yeah, I think there's there's going to be a differentiator between brands that are uh, scrappy and the brands that are uh, super focused on their product set, not too expand. They're not too wide as a business, right? When you're too wide, you have to start cutting off the edges to to make things work. Um, and then, like you said, with the bigger corporations on on their acquisitions and investments, if that's going to be something that has to to come rolling down the hill, right? Um, but uh, we as a community, though. Uh, a lot of times uh, new people, quote unquote, will come into it and then all of a sudden a brand disappears or changes or whatever. So the cool factor is gone for them because in their neck, neck, neck of the woods, that's the thing. Right. Um, and then all of a sudden that just changes their perspective. When COVID hit, and we all started getting outdoors and started smelling the trees again and started tasting the dirt again. Like it changed a lot of people's perspectives that were in our sport. Right. And or just new to uh, our sport, but have recreational ambitions already um i think that for the most part our community will continue to grow i just i'm i'm worried about the brands they're investing their dollars in and making sure that we're picking the right brands and, and the people that matter to our community because if we put all our money in those that don't care then those dollars were wasted yeah yeah i agree for me the uh you know i think that my biggest salesman has always been the guy that owns the jack um you know i have you know i have our fair share of haters or people that you know had a problem and you know they want you to fix it like right now or yesterday and you know i can't necessarily do that all the time um but for the most part i would say that you know 99.9 percent .9 of my customers that buy a jack are happy with their purchase and they are the number one salesperson so you know, yes, we came out of a situation where people had lots of free money coming at them and, you know, hey, and we're working from home now. I'm not spending money on gas and all that other stuff. So they had more money to spend. So therefore, I gained more customers because of it. But I gained more customers. Therefore, I gained more salespeople. Right. So that guy's got it in his garage and his neighbor comes over and sees him working on his car and goes, I need one of those, too. Right. So for me, the more jacks that are out there, the more potential I have to sell more. So, right. Yeah. And then you have the benefit, like we were talking about the snap on effect, like even if it gets rough and you're out in your garage, you know, wrenching more than you are riding. Like you're not going to get rid of your jack. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We talk about it all the time. Like, you know, I think that I have a uh, somewhat of a unique situation where, you know, yes, when times are good, people bought jacks. But when times are bad and people aren't going out and spending all that, uh, you know, the money, the extra money that they had, they're still at home working on their vehicles and doing stuff. And it's still a tool that's necessary. You know, it's a some would call it an extravagant tool, but it's still a tool, you know? So whether you're going out and having fun or whether you're at home working in your garage, it's still a tool and you got to right. have it. So, and like you said, across the board, right? You got multiple things that, that require that kind of functionality. So, um, anything you guys are looking forward to this year? I mean, the year is halfway over now. I like to, to ask that question to everybody. Uh, we have, uh, the summer coming up, which is kind of like the busy time for the businesses, not necessarily the, the run and gun type, but, Fall's coming and the racing circuit around fall and August and, and all that. And then dune season following that quote unquote, right? We're at the dunes now, but that's because we're in the Northwest. <laughs> we're not in 120 degrees in Glamis, right? Um, you know, looking forward to the, the rest of the year and, and maybe into January, uh, uh, January's events and things like that around the country. What are we looking forward to? Charles. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I don't know other than, you know, we have a lot of new exciting product that we're working on coming out. We have, you know, we're, we're always evolving even the current product, you know, it's nowhere near what it was when we first started. Um, so I'm excited about the new things that we have coming, new products that we have coming, um, new revolutions and improvements on the current product. Um, you know, that's what I'm most excited about. And that's something that I didn't hit on earlier was the fact that you revision and, and continue to improve. You were talking about seals and stuff like that. You know, we talk about other brands that are out there that people kind of gravitate to for price point reasons or whatever. Um, you know, you're not looking at a product that you can then go onto the website and upgrade the piston or upgrade the bellows or upgrade the, the whatever, or replace the wheel. Like you're not going to be able to go get those kind right. of service parts or upgrades or whatever. Yeah. Um, 
And so that's that's something that you guys do with your with your product, right? You you continue to maintain and improve and and push it push it forward to the consumer. They see the same SKU on the you know the website that they're buying, right? right? But they're also able to then go and get those parts and get those upgrades and get those uh, that relationship with the brand, right? You can you can maintain that product over time, and it's still right. the same jack that you bought, or if not better every year going after that right yeah 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 and the more the more parts that we develop and you know we have a new pump for the two and the three ton um you know we had the opportunity to change the size and and such on it but i'm like no we have to develop it so that it will drop into the older jacks um you know i don't want a person that has a jack that's two or three or five or ten years old to go hey this jack doesn't work anymore how do i fix it or get it to upgrade it and say i'm sorry but you need to buy a new jack you know i don't ever want that so if i have a new pump or new development or whatever i will always want it to be retrofitted into the older jacks or at least build something to adapt it so that person can have a jack that's 10 years old and maybe it doesn't work anymore but he puts a seal in it or replaces the pump and now it's brand new again and that's a different approach right like not planning on that obsolescence is a a differentiator for brands right like talk about whips like some brands are just planning (laughs) are just planning on having to replace your whips two or three times before you move on to another brand yeah right and that's two or three times a week (laughs) (laughs) seen it this week alone but you know that it's just a different mindset like brands approach things different and, and the decision makers behind that have their different ethics and different reasonings and a lot of times that's corporate pushed, right? Like they'll have math- mathematician guys like this week equates out to a better long term for the customer or whatever for us as a as a financial benefit. Yeah, well, I think you see that with Chuck and I's brands. I mean, I, I won't say the company, but I was having a conversation with another whip company and they sell multiple whips for the same vehicle, right? So they sell you a whip maybe that you would use during the day and a whip that you would maybe use during the night. I'm like, why? Why not make one product that works all the time like why why sell somebody a whip during the day and at the end of the day it comes down to it's just more skews that they can sell and i'm like i'd rather build one product that works all the time and just sell them that yeah i i make day whips for mining or whatever you want to call it but that's because it's for an application i don't tell consumers hey you get both of these because you can use this one one time i want to sell one product that works all the time and something i don't ever want to oversell the customer or give them something they don't need i want them to buy exactly what they need and buy it once and i think that's one of the things you see with chuck and i and and one of the things i respect about chuck is he doesn't have to put an extension with the jack but he does right he doesn't sell you a product that oh hey yeah the three ton gets here but you also have to buy this add-on and this add-on it's like no here's the box and it's got everything you need now, if you want to upgrade or do other things, there's ease, but here's what you need from the start. And I think that's rare to find companies that do that. I think you see in this industry, oh, you got to buy that. Oh, you also need to buy, and not just in this industry, but in every industry. Yeah, yeah it's it, like, again, the perspective. And I think it comes down to, you can really identify, you know, how much the brand cares about the consumer by how they approach the sale, right? And yeah, there are some premium products out there that I'm I fully support that do have you know, the core product and then the way that you attach it or the, you know, whatever the case is. But, you know, that's just simply because they need to give you flexibility too, right? And they don't want to necessarily package it and say, that's your be all end all way of doing it. And if it doesn't work, sorry, they want to give some flexibility there. So there's ways that you can approach it and not be, in my opinion, you know, greedy with it. Um, But but there are some companies that are and it's unfortunate that they have to really put in because the sales guys having to defend that you know at the show like <laughs> but but you are right i mean it's it's not a matter of if, there, if there's upgrades or things you have to add i totally understand that it's just when you're trying to just continually push more products just to right. drive a sale up it's like why why not just build something that works like if you have to add add-ons i, I understand but why just do it just to do it i I never understood that concept right and that that, like i said that that if you pay attention to it and you're not just a glossed over consumer you can you can really kind of weed out those companies from the other ones pretty quick yeah and and like i said usually the companies that that are doing that have kind of vague people behind the table talking to you too so (laughs) uh that's another easy way to figure that out right um so uh you said you got some new products coming out what kind of time frame we're looking on uh on some new jacks uh hopefully middle of the year next year uh we'll have some stuff that's um uh, 
I hate to use the word higher in, but um, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll have some stuff that's specific for, you know, um, trophy truck type applications and race applications and stuff like that. Uh, we'll have some stuff that's um, uh, different types of UTV jacks. And, you know, um, we're expanding into jack stands and different um, base plates for current jack. And, you know, I'd like to be that. Complimentary skews. Right. Yeah. I'd like to be that one stop shop. You know, I get it all the time where people ask, hey, do you guys offer jack stands? And I'm like, well, for the longest time, you know, it's still to this day, I'm like, you know, a jack stand is just a jack stand. It's a, you know, whether you bought a $29 Harbor Freight jack stand or whether you bought a $200 uh, uh, snap on jack stand, it's really the same jack stand. There's no technology in it. Um, if you're like, yeah, I don't care though. I still, I want a pro Eagle Jack stand, you know, I have a pro Eagle Jack. I want a pro Eagle Jack stand. Um, so we've developed something that works for the dirt works for taller vehicles and, and, um, uh, that's exciting. So it'll be out soon. Uh, so it gives that, that, like you said, that complimentary product and that, um, that consumer that is really stands behind our brand you know you have people that you know swear by nike shoes and i don't want anywhere any wear anything but nikes and i've been fortunate enough to create those those people those brand uh, the consumers that are stand behind pro eagle enough to be like i want everything pro eagle you know if you guys make that and and you know i'll buy yours so yeah so, yeah and that's just a testament to to quality people and quality product right, right. yeah so um yeah so uh you guys are here through the rest of the week to to the end right you're gonna be here through the week of takeover uh are you both doing the rest of the takeover circuit or are you guys uh hitting utah only or that is the plan it's uh i think the plan we were talking about this morning I mean, i'm pretty sure chuck and i will do oklahoma um i really want to go to oklahoma and and, and for a lot of reasons. One, the people in Oklahoma are fantastic. The writing venue, Mid America, I've heard nothing but just amazing things about it. I want to go for the experience. To be honest, I kind of want to go as a consumer. Um, and to, and why to, not? They're putting so much money into investing in the consumer and the experience for the race teams and for the events and stuff like that. So and Takeover just does a fantastic job. Like, why don't you want to be part? And I, we will. How it pans out to get there, I don't know. I mean, the reality of it is, is the economy is changing and fuel prices are extremely high and it's a long trek. <laughs> it's and a long, hot ride. <laughs> to yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's not that bad. You know, Chuck and I sing together and we have romantic <laughs> songs and like, like there's breakdowns. It's an entire adventure. <laughs> it to, it is, start, it is a, never not an adventure with Russ. And to get back to your original question, that's how we actually became friends is, you know, Adrian Oriana, we both were involved with his race program. Rancho um, Racing. Yeah. So he introduced us and, uh, uh, then it was like, hey, you know, I'm going to do this show in um, uh, Moab, Utah. We went to Easter Jeep oh, Safari. God. And oh, he's like, yeah, geez. yeah. He's like, I've been thinking about doing that, too. <laughs> so <laughs> driving with Russ, pulling his uh, stacker trailer, driving his, uh, you know, 2000 lifted uh, GM Duramax uh, with sloppy steering. And he's driving <laughs> he's driving like this all, so sketchy. all the way to Moab. So sketchy. I almost died about 57 times. <laughs> so uh, sketchy. We had conversations on the way. We, uh, you know, we're we're very similar in growing our brand and creating our brand and, you know, and trying to um, push the envelope and all that stuff. But that's what's really made us friends is, you know, we almost, almost died almost together, died together time. 70 <laughs> times. Yeah. Yeah. On and it's every trip. Yeah. So Not it's always an adventure. So, um, you know, I have a lot of friends that I've known for longer than Russ that I'm not quite as close to as Russ just because of that. So yeah, those adventures across the country to to, uh, to Oklahoma are what makes us friends. You know, I have a lot of people that are like, you know, I can't believe that you're around that guy so much. You know, and I'm like, ah, it's, it, he's just is what it is. So <laughs> it's a party. Yeah. I think we've been on one trip that was successful. That there was nothing went wrong. I think it was Mud Nats, the ride home yep. from Mud Nats. I don't think going there was successful. I mean, it it anything that can go wrong will go wrong with me. Period. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how well planned it is. It doesn't matter anything, but we look up, always find a way to get through it. Look up Murphy's Law. The, he has a picture of Russ. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the adventures have been fun. I mean, we've had a lot of adventures together. A lot. 
of adventures together. So, what, what's the what's the best song you've uh, duetted over the radios? <laughs> well, we had a conversation once about who's the best singer of all time. That was a good conversation. That, for yeah. hours. Yeah, yeah, it was a couple hours. Yeah, yeah. yeah he's a big. Uh, he thinks Whitney Houston is the best female singer. I there's mean, ever it, been, it's but. just the reality of it. She yeah. is the best there ever was. <laughs> but anytime he's ever been in his UTV, he comes uh, jamming uh, out to a Madonna like a vir- <laughs> like a virgin. I'm like, are you sure it's Madonna hey, or Whitney Houston? Hey, I I like the 80s man i would grow i'd have a mullet and dude the 80s were rad that's where it was hey, at you, you could have a mullet we don't see what's under that hat very often we don't i wear a hat all <laughs> the time i don't think there's a time i've never not had a hat on <laughs> but i think per, this is pretty much where i'm at <laughs> yeah exactly no i think that's what makes chuck and i fun is that like this time he was gonna drive separate and he was i was like no oh, you're not gonna have fun now it'll go smooth <laughs> it was, it's not gonna be an adventure yeah and it, now now is it always chuck rescuing <laughs> rescuing russ from the side of the road or is it both ways no i mean i don't think that we rescue either one of us we're just in it together so you know it's, and it's an adventure always it doesn't matter yeah yeah there's i can tell you stories that go on for days now, we, now, do you have to follow that big traveling mirror of a bus, or do you step up front? <laughs> no. So that, that's the, that's a good part. Is usually I'm with him, but on this trip out here, I pulled our own trailer, and uh, we t- we met up in Reading, and we were going to go together for the rest of the way. And after about ten minutes of staring myself in the mirror <laughs> of the back door, I drove around. I'm like, I can't stand that anymore. I don't want to look at myself. <laughs> for, for for reference, how tall is your trailer? Thirteen six. Thirteen six of straight up polished. <laughs> Stainless, stainless, stainless steel, stainless steel. For, with the sun baking down straight back into your mm-hmm. eyeballs. Yep, yep. <laughs> you get a lot of fingers driving down the road. A lot of. I'm I not, noticed. I noticed there was no branding on the back of the trailer either. There's no branding on that trailer at all. When it is going down the street, it is sheerly a trailer. <laughs> Just a big, a big rich guy in a red trailer pissing everybody off. No, that's bougie broke right there. There's no money. That is just pure bougie broke. I, I'll tell you, man. That's like probably probably one of the nicest trailers on the event circuit right now. It's it, you know what? It serves me well. It's been a great trailer, and it's it's a lot of fun. The thing is, is it gets a lot of comment right because it is a pure mirror on the back door i mean it every inch of it there is nothing but pure graded stainless on that thing so it's it gets a lot of attention and a lot of stuff and the adventures have been really fun i mean we have done everything together we've not gotten in mexico together i think we've not gotten out of mexico together yeah <laughs> <laughs> we've been to almost every state we slept on the side of the road. Yeah, it's it's just been an adventure yeah. every day. So so to kind of wrap up the episode, you both have uh, Honda Talons in your group. How how with all the Razors and all the Can Ams, greatest car ever. I mean, what's your opinion of the of the greatest Honda? And how ever. does that how does that work out for you? Because you you also don't drive a Honda. You also have a big badass Can Am. So I have a very fast Evo built Can Am that is that will kill anybody is the car is amazing i mean it won't kill anybody there's there's incredibly fast cars evo built i mean jeffrey's built some 500 horsepower cars and but it is a very fast extremely fun car but honestly the honda talon is by far hands down the best utv because it works always i built that honda talon what three years ago two years ago it's never failed like it rolls in the trailer and goes the whole film crew's using it this weekend. Everybody's been driving. It's had like six different drivers in it. It never breaks. I mean, never breaks. That car never has a failure. I've never been in a Polaris or Ray. They all make great cars, right? And we have to be it's realistic. It's hard to buy a bad car. It's hard to buy a bad car, and we have to be realistic, right? The Honda is the turtle, right? It's not the fastest car out here. But the car gets it done, right? It's extremely fun. You can go anywhere, and it's a driver's car, right? You have to really drive the car. That's shifting. And I think, you know, you look at the Pro-R, there's just no comparison between the two, right? The, the Pro-R is the biggest, baddest car ever made, and it's a phenomenal car. I just, there's something special about what Honda does and the quality behind it. I think that's why I like working with Honda is they represent a lot of who I am as a brand, right? Is they... They strive for perfection. They strive to make the best product out there, and they do. I mean, that car works no matter what all the time. 
literally turn the key and you've, go. You've taken it, obviously, here in the dunes. You've taken it into the, into the, the rocks. You've taken well, it into the... car in the rocks. Thing's awesome. I, I love the Talon. And, and you know what's unique about the Talon that I don't think, and I think Chuck will agree with this, there's a lot of nice Can-Ams. There's a really a lot of nice players. Says, but everybody's seen them, right? So there's nothing special about them where people come over. I mean, we have more people that stop at the booth and look at the Talon than any other car I have there because they're like, that's a Talon? I didn't know it could look like that, right? Like the Honda is the old 900 days where you took a 900 and you're like, wow, that's – or Rhino days where you were like, wow, that's what that can look like. And I, I think it just gets – so much attention because people see it and they're like, wow, like this is this is amazing what this car can do. So it's a great car. I really have nothing but fantastic things to say about Honda and everything they've done. And and Chuck, you take the family out in yours and 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 go for rips. When it, and how does the family? I mean, do they know any different or is it just kind of like uh, that became the preferred platform? Or yeah, no. So I'm fairly new to the UTV industry as a whole, and or I should say, being a UTV owner. Um, you know, I grew up in off road racing, and it was always trucks, and you know, run a you know a Toyota truck in Baja, and uh, it's always been trucks. Uh, when I met my girlfriend or fiance, she had a, a a Jeep JK, and she was a hardcore rock crawler. Um, so I was either going fast in the desert or in a truck, and she was about going slow and crawling over rocks and a lot of stuff. So we're new to UTV ownership. Um, but you're very familiar with clutching and, and all that stuff. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, but coming to the UTV ownership and, and having a, a Honda, uh, it was unique to the industry. Uh, and I'm always been, you know, about being different, you know, pushing the envelope and, you know, I don't want to have, uh, you know, I, I love those cars, so I don't really want to say anything bad about it, but you know, the, I didn't want to have a, another Can-Am or another Polaris. Right. Uh, so it just fit and it worked for us. And, um, we put a turbo on ours last year and I got to be honest with you, I was um, uh, unsure about how I would be able to keep up out there. And Russ's Can-Am um, definitely kicks ass. And following some of those other guys through the dune, even yesterday uh, on the um, on the ride out with uh, with HCR. You know, I was a little bit worried about it, and you know, all the all the new pro R's took off in front of us, and I'm like, well, I don't know if we're gonna keep up with them or not. And they never lost us; they never pulled right. away. And I wasn't even trying hard, so I'm like, okay, well, you know, this is this is where it's at. So it's which a, uh, which turbo kit you throw on there? Uh, Jackson Turbo. The Jacksons. Yeah, yeah. So we have the HDR kit. Um, again, with the family, I wanted to make it safe, so we have a nice uh, SF built cage. Um, Spark. I work with Sparko a lot, so I bought their um, their seats, so it keeps us nice and tight in there. And uh, I'm not worried about the kids in the back. And yeah, it's got it's got enough power to to keep up with just about any vehicle out there, and I love it. <laughs> yeah, I think it's awesome. They just they just came out with their refresh for for next year with the new fascia, made it a little bit wider, a little bit more. Uh, what I call the from spider to alien yeah, look, yeah, um, and uh, cleaned it up a little bit. But uh, they're definitely one of those companies that don't, you know, iterate every year with a new package and a new trim and a new whatever. They're just kind of keeping the bar where they set it high and then just leaving it there, right? They're not right. trying to be the one all for everybody. They're trying to be the thing that does it and does it well, you know, reliably and every time. And and the clutching yeah. on those is is pretty unique too it, it has a lot of sport in it and you can get that thing pretty peppy so i well, can only imagine with the turbo what that ramp up looks like yeah well i think we forget about this i definitely have till i went to the south honda talon out here isn't that big of a car honda right. talon in the mud is a massive car yeah you don't yeah. see pro Especially r's in the mud and stuff. yeah you don't see pro r's in the mud it's not about going fast it's about slow and fun and so I think Honda took to a market, the trail riders, that, and that car for that is phenomenal, right? You're not going to see the pro R's out in trails and, you know, in the South and some of that, the trails aren't wide enough for it. Right. And so I think sometimes I miss that. And I had a long conversation with a customer who was asking about how many UTVs are sold and, you know, Razor's the number one selling UTV. And then he started looking at the numbers like, it's not like it's, there's all this farming stuff and all yeah. this other stuff that yeah. we forget about, yeah. but we make products for. I think that's one of the things that's really interesting is you can, you spend 90% of your time in marketing for here, but the reality of it is we sell products to the farmers, the agricultural, the mudders, all these other communities that we just don't see. And that's one of the reasons I'm excited to go to Oklahoma is to re-immerse myself in that other community in mid-America. Yeah. The cool thing about there is they have 
everything but this there, right? They right. have the racing, they have the mudding, they have the lazy river, they have all this other stuff that that's what 90% of what UTVs is dedicated to. So I'm excited to go see that end of it too. And I think that's the thing about Honda is that they built a platform for that. Yeah, and it's also the kind of the in between, right? Like it's not the YXZ like beat you up and like pure raw adrenaline clutch banging, right. you know, short course cutting. It's kind of in between that and a razor or whatever. Sure. It's kind of like you get the the benefit of the clutch, but you get the comfort and relaxability of of a bigger car. Yeah, hundred percent. And I and I think the thing about Honda that that you know I've talked to Honda extensively about, and the thing that's their brand. If you're gonna go buy a generator, what do you buy? A Honda. If you're going to go buy a car or a minivan to take your family in, what do you buy? I just a bought a Honda, Honda lawnmower. <laughs> yeah, a Honda lawnmower. You buy, Honda makes a product for your, you could buy nothing but Honda and have a product that works every day for the rest of your life. It's the car you take your family in. It's the UTV you go off-roading in. It's the generator you power your motor home with, right? They make a product for everything. I think that's one of the unique things about Honda versus all these other brands is they really make a product for your everyday life all the time and they're smart about how they do it and what they do and you know it, it's a driver's car i mean look at Raceco winning the baja what was it the thousand or 500 they won mm -hmm. yeah. in a honda talent over all the other utvs yeah, the I proctor mean, race program's really starting to get into its own this this year with with all their wins sure so i mean it's one of those things the car's not it's it's a great car you just have to get over that hump of this is what i need it to look like and that and it's a phenomenal product yeah, no, I can't. I can't agree more. And it it is always getting. It always gets eyes because it's just not the thing that everybody has, right? And that's also, you know, like you were saying, uh, it, it, that standing out just on your own by the fact that you picked a, a, a high quality product, but that just just isn't as popular. Always gets more eyeballs. So, yeah. um, well, let's wrap this up. We're at takeover. We got two more days of this uh, craziness. Hopefully, the wind will die down oh, tomorrow before Hugfest. Um, we're going to, uh, I'm going to get out and do some filming and hopefully do a, a live stream test out on uh, on the short course. We'll see how that goes. Uh, and if everything goes well, then Saturday we'll be doing a live stream on our channels uh, for Hugfest and Willie Fest. Um, so that'll be cool. And uh, maybe you guys could swing up there and, and come say hi or something. But uh, we'll have talking head and all that jazz. Um, where can we find more about Pro Eagle and how can we follow what you're doing over there, Chuck? Uh, we're on social media at Pro underscore Eagle. Uh, our, our website is always kept up to date uh, with new things coming out, new activities, you know, what's coming soon. Um, Facebook and uh, that's about it. And that was ProEagle.com. ProEagle.com, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and Russell, where can we find you online and, and keep up with your uh, your hair regiment? Uh, that would be, um, well, we let's, uh, I don't know Vidal that we want to put that pub publicly. <laughs> yeah. That's my own private page, um, where I talk about hair products and, uh, skincare. Do, no, I'm just joking. Do you joking. have a, a TikTok where you put on the, the product? And <laughs> I, so I tell you a true story. I do not. And, and my hair is okay. And Chuck can affirm this. My wife has the most beautiful hair that you can possibly have on a human being. And she has her own <laughs> hair channel and hair red. I mean, he won't, and it is always something special. So I, I am, So you learn from the best and you it, keep it maintained. I mean, I, Chuck will tell you her hair is phenomenal hair. So <laughs> I do learn from the best, but no buggywhip.com and buggy whip Inc on social media platforms and, uh, at the shows and wherever we're at you can find us and learn more about us. And, Hopefully, or talk to your grandpa or your dad because they probably <laughs> ran our product. Or, or if there's a like, mine next to your house, you can go oh. down there and find Russell uh, selling some whips. Yep, or agricultural. <laughs> you know, talk to talk to Justin Lofton. He just put them all on his farm, and it's doing really well out there. So cool. Well, uh, keep up with us online. You can find us on Google, on Apple, on Spotify, iHeartRadio, all the different places. And if you do enjoy watching the bromance of Chuck and <laughs> Russ uh, and his luscious locks, you can watch us on YouTube uh, for every episode. You can find us on the website, sidebysideguys.com uh, and uh, takeover, uh, utvtakeover.com for the show schedule and uh, where these guys will be next on the circuit. So um, I hope you, everybody has a great weekend. We hope for a safe and awesome weekend with Huck Fest and Willie Fest and all that. And uh, until the next time, guys, peace.